joined on the podcast this week by Joe Buck uh, from his hotel room in Texas. Uh, Joe, you're getting ready to do game six. It's Tuesday afternoon. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because I'm totally fascinated with like the travel aspect, the logistics aspect of what exactly you have done. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to ask you, yesterday, which is Monday, you had your first day off in a while, okay? And I wonder, you know, how many days had it been since you basically, and I have no idea what you did, but that you weren't assigned to do something that 15 million people in the United States were going to watch. Yeah, uh, man, it, yesterday was it was a weird day. It's like I just somebody pulled the plug out of the wall and I just sat in my room staring at the aforementioned wall. Uh, <laughs> I, I it, it's been crazy. It's been a blast, though. It's been for at that point up until yesterday, it had been uh, 14 straight days of doing a national broadcast. And it started with. Uh, two Mondays ago, the NLCS. So I went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, baseball, Thursday, football, which I, I think was in Chicago. Then Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Tampa Bay, Monday uh, in Buffalo, Tuesday, game one of the World Series and so on. So I, I, uh, I've i been in and out of Dallas. I think I can vote here. I've been here long enough. Uh, I, I'm not registered, however, here in uh here in Texas. So I'm, uh, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm figuring out that I think I'm schizophrenic because I can have one personality that does all baseball and I can have one personality that does all football and never the two shall meet. So I'm pretty good at uh, compartmentalizing and, and, and handling what's in front of me for that next 24 hours. That was really, um, uh, that has been really, really interesting to me because, um, uh, you don't sound like, and I really watched for how you were going to handle the game in Buffalo, the 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 Chiefs and, uh, or who was it? Yeah, Chiefs and Bills. Yeah, yeah, Chiefs and Bills. And I really wanted to find something. It wasn't like I was testing you or anything, but I really wanted to find something that happened that showed, well, geez, he's exhausted. So, and I didn't. And I didn't find it. I'm sure there has been a day where when the light goes on, you really have to muster up something or you really have to have a five hour energy or something like that. But what do you actually do about fatigue? And are you able to sleep as much as you feel you really need to? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I can let you in on my my own personal secret is I, I made a pact with myself that for the last two plus weeks now going on three weeks, I wasn't gonna have a drink, uh, which to me is a big deal. Um, my wife and I, Michelle uh, Beisner, who works at ESPN, we like to when we put our two and a half year old twins down, we like to share a bottle of wine and watch whatever the hell we're binge watching at the time. And uh, I just thought, you know, for the next two and a half, this is the first time I've done that, uh, for the next two and a half weeks, I'm not going to have alcohol in my life. And that's helped me sleep. I mean, I wear this whoop thing that tracks my, uh, my sleep, tracks my calories, tracks, you know, the strain, so to speak, on my day. And my REM sleep has been off the charts. So I've actually, I got to be honest with you, being away from home, and I, I joke about this with Michelle all the time because of the two and a half year old twins. I've had more sleep here than I've had in two and a half years. So I, I've yeah. I've really never uh, gotten up in the morning and there, there's nothing in the early morning that I have to do except try to force myself to work out uh, that has made me feel tired at the end of the day. So, I mean, part of announcing is acting. Nobody talks like this or... Hey, everybody, welcome to the ball game. You know, nobody talks like that. Brockmeyer does. Hank Azaria's character. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, you have to act a little bit. But once you get into that mode and you realize that you're doing something that people really care about, uh, it's easy to find that gear. And uh, at the end of the night, I'm done talking. I mean, I'm, I, I'm two words to my wife and I go to bed or I'll watch something uh, on my my iPad. Uh, before I go to sleep and and I try to I've been reading a book try to just distance myself as much as I can 
so that in the morning I'm I'm ready and I want to go to work uh, on on that night's game. Um, has the dip, it, has it been difficult at all to do the proper amount of homework? And how exactly do you do that? I assume once you're doing a series in baseball, you do not have to look up, you know, numbers or you don't have to read anything about Azarena or Walker yeah. Bueller. You know those guys. You've been doing this. But it, it, what sort of homework do you have to do and how do you do that? Well, when I get when I do baseball, baseball and football are so different for me. Like when I when I show up on a Sunday or on a Thursday, my football work is done. I, if, if, you know, we show up three and a half, four hours before the game, if they kicked it off one minute after I walked in, I'd be ready to go. Baseball, I have the skeleton of what I need. I have the, my scorebook with everything except the most important part, which is the lineup, which I don't know until I get to the stadium. So for baseball, the three hours before first pitch, I'm going and I'm writing down the lineups and I'm looking at different things. And I've, now I've already done the pitching matchup. And I've already put the scorebook and it's ready to go. But there's a lot of work once you get to the stadium. Football, that's why when when you ask me, and you're right, when you get into a series, you, you kind of just go day to day. And, and I know what's happened at every turn. I don't have to read about it. I don't have to act like I've been there. I've been there. So for football, I spend my days now getting ready for my football games. So when you and I hang up, I'm going to read the clips. Uh, I've got two games this week. I've got Carolina and Atlanta on Thursday, and then the Saints and Bears on Sunday. And I'll be up to date. I mean, I, I feel like once I get through the clips and I do my work and I've already got my boards done for those games, uh, I, I can just add on. And I don't ever feel like I'm rushed or ill-prepared when I walk into that booth. And it feels like a normal week to me. And, and that's when I'm at my best, when I can just kind of relax and be myself. Did Fox ever say to you, <laughs> let's sit down and figure out a schedule so that you're not doing a World Series game one night and then Giants and Philly uh, the next night and all that stuff? I mean, was there ever the thought that you should – skip something on one of the in one of the two sports yeah well the only time i skipped was when game seven of the nlcs coincided with uh, uh tampa bay hosting green bay and that was determined two months ago um you know that that is one of those where i just say to my bosses eric shanks and brad zager you know, what's your pick? And and I go to wherever they send me. And in this case, it was the football game with Tampa Bay and Green Bay. And, you know, the numbers are big. They're big. I, I always when people talk about baseball ratings, the part that's always left out is the cumulative rating of the entire month. I mean, th these are these are massive numbers in today's world. So you could make the case either way. But that's the only time, you know, if there's a conflict, I go where they tell me. Typically, football gets the nod. Not all, It wouldn't in the World Series, but it just so happened that the off day in the World Series was Thursday, so I could go do uh, Eagles and Giants. And uh, if, if the day's free, I can get there, and, and they trust me to prepare accordingly uh and be ready and 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 i feel like i've been able to do that so it's it's a grind for two and a half weeks but it's still not what people in the real world do every day and and i'm i'm well aware of that so uh i had a good teacher in my dad with that with a work ethic and and i feel like i've tried to follow through with what he showed me when i was a kid your dad you know what i really remember about your dad really i thought he was unbelievable on the radio and not just in baseball you know i yeah. but but i mean and i wonder uh did he ever have a stretch like this did he ever have a two week stretch where he's doing baseball almost every day and then maybe he breaks away and does a sunday game for cbs somewhere or how, how did yeah. his schedule work i just remember when i was a kid you know, obviously well before cell phones and well before FaceTime, which is your way now to connect, you know, with my two and a half year olds, which by the way, they're punishing me. They're running away every time I FaceTime because <laughs> yeah. they're mad that I'm gone. But I, 
uh, there were stretches of two weeks where, you know, you barely heard from him. Now, he was my best friend, so I don't I don't have any bitterness toward that. But he was working his tail off and, and doing uh, doing Cardinal baseball every day, leaving on Sunday, going to do or Saturday evening and going to do a Sunday TV CBS game and then going to Monday night football for CBS radio with Hank Stram. And then coming back to Cardinal baseball on a day-to-day basis when the two sports would overlap. So, uh, you know, I would say that uh, over the course of a year, he worked 10 times harder than, than I, I work. Now, this is, this is maybe higher profile because the day-to-day in my world right now is the NLCS or the World Series on national TV. And he was doing Cardinal baseball and then going away and doing these other things. But uh it, there's no comparison i mean he and he was doing morning radio call-in shows in st louis during that time so i i have nothing to complain about and the idea that when people ask me all that how are you doing all this i just think of my dad would be over in the corner laughing and <laughs> he heard somebody asking me that because he he blew by this uh every year who's the who in baseball like who in the world series now on the rays or the dodgers Who's a really big football fan that when you talk to them, he wants to talk about Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady and not uh, how, how they're going to hit the curveball tonight? It's funny. You know, I feel like it's it's almost like that age old actor athlete thing. I feel like all baseball guys really care about is football uh, as fans, at least. I mean, baseball is so consuming with the day to day during a typical year, not in 2020 with uh, 162 that. When they're away from the park or when they're even getting ready for a game, they're watching football. I, I just will never forget interviewing Bryce Harper from the outfield while I was in the booth during the All-Star game. And he's asking me about Dak Prescott. This was a <laughs> couple of years ago. And I, I it was so out of – he said something to me like, you know, how about Dak in the year he had? And it took me a minute to go, what the hell is he talking – oh, Dak yeah. Prescott? Like we're <laughs> – yeah. so I feel like they're all that way. Kershaw wants to talk about football. Uh, Walker Bueller wants to talk about golf. These guys – that's – you know, but when – you know this as well as I do. When you go – you're in the football world, at least for us, it's probably different for you. But for forever when we sat down with Bill Belichick, it didn't matter who the matchup was. It didn't matter what the stakes were in that game. He was as tight-lipped as you could be. But the minute I brought up Tony La Russa or MLB or the history of the curveball, he wouldn't stop talking. But yeah. but then you go, hey, is uh, you know, so is Brady okay? Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll determine that. He wouldn't even tell you if Brady was playing that week. So it's it's funny, you know, when it's your life you get you've been there done it but they want to know about the outside stuff so i I would say just to throw a blanket over it i i don't think i talk to anybody that's not interested in in some little uh some little advantage let's say for whatever reason their fantasy football team or their their team pool to what's going on in the nfl do all those guys really have a fantasy team like do all the baseball players and managers and everything do they do they play fantasy football? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I can't say all, but I think, you know, I know just from the Cardinals perspective, Adam Wainwright does it for charity and they have a league and they raise money and, but they're into it. I mean, they're competitive. You know, these athletes, you know, they're competitive on anything. And uh, you know, it's, it's kind of that I'm better than you mentality that they take onto the field is the same thing they take into fantasy football is the same thing they take on, you know, I remember traveling around with the Cardinals and you'd have a, a everybody put in five bucks and whose ever bag came off the carousel first would win the pot every time you landed in a city. So it's they can't get enough action and uh, and fantasy football is a layup for them. They, yeah, they 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 love it. Uh, Joe, I, I'm, I'm really I, I, there's so many interesting things about this stretch in your life, but one of them is. And I kind of feel bad about asking you to do this, but one of them is about taking care of your voice when you have to do, you have to be on for say three and a half to four hours. And these days in baseball, it's probably on the longer end, but do you do anything special at this time of year to take care of your voice? 
Well, I don't smoke. That helps. I grew up, you know, we keep talking about my dad, but when I started in the broadcast booth and I was 21 with the Cardinals, my dad smoked, Mike Shannon smoked, the uh, radio engineer smoked, everybody everybody in the booth smoked. And, and that's why my dad ended up sounding like this. Here's a ground ball to short, picked up by Ozzy over to first, two out. And, and that was just a part of, of life back then. So I think I've helped myself in that regard. Um, I, I've been lucky. I had the one year in 2011 where I had a paralyzed vocal cord and I thought my career was over. I got over that. And I feel actually, Peter, like the longer I talk, the more I talk, the more I get swelling with those vocal cords and then they actually touch easier. I, I know about the apparatus way too much, but unless you have some sort of laryngitis going on, which I, I really try like hell to, to just go from my room to the lobby, to the car, to the stadium, and then reverse it. Uh, the more I talk, the more swelling I get in there, the easier it is for me to talk. So I, I knock on wood, I've only one time I did an NFC championship game in Philly and I, I woke up on a Sunday morning. I was getting sick. I couldn't make a sound. I had to find a doctor on a Sunday to, to give me a steroid injection and by miraculously by eight o'clock that night or six o'clock that night, I could speak. And that's the only time I've dealt with that. So um, I'm fortunate along those lines that it's not anything that I really worry about. Do you, what do you drink during the day? Coffee, tea, water? What do you well, do? Coffee is, coffee is terrible for your voice, but I cannot live without it. So yeah. I, you know, I mean, you're watching me drink uh, Starbucks and only in Dallas. I mean, we don't have this in St. Louis. There's like a Starbucks reserve uh, oh, yeah, bar yeah. that, yeah. We don't have that in, uh, we don't have these high, high pollutant things in St. <laughs> Louis, but I, uh, yeah, I, I drink coffee all day. And then during the game, I have this thing, which is, it's called a Contigo, which keeps, uh, everything hot in it. It's like a Yeti. Uh, yeah. and I, I drink tea or I'll just drink water, room temperature water, but in my bladder, uh, which is on record as being one of the smallest uh, in the history of broadcasting, is uh, is an issue. So if I'm just pounding water all game, I'm constantly running back and forth and trying to beat the commercial back before yeah. uh, before I sit down. And and you know, I, I, I there have been many times where I have left the booth to go to the bathroom and waited for the stage manager to count backward from five. Wow. Wait till he gets till three, just to see how much Smoltz and Aikman freak out, uh, yeah. <laughs> knowing that if I'm not sitting there, they have to bring it back from commercial break. But I've made it about 99% of the time. <laughs> um, I got to ask you two baseball questions. One, I'm kind of fascinated by Kevin Cash, and I'm a big baseball fan. And he does things like bring his closer in in the fifth inning because he figures that that is the most important, you know, there's a good chance that that's going to be the most important two outs he needs to get. If he's got second and third and the closer has got the best chance to get out without either of those guys scoring, great, we're going to do it. What do you think of the way he manage, manages and he's kind of setting baseball on its ear? I love it. I, first of all, he's great. He's funny. Uh, he's got a lot of energy. You'd love him. If you haven't met him, you probably have, but he, He's great. And, and I think that's kind of the wave of the future. I mean, I think yeah. if you step back and you realize this is the 28th, 29th payroll in Major League Baseball, this is how they have to do it. And they make yeah. no bones about it. They're, they don't hide that. It's fact. a great they, accompaniment. A it great really is. accomplishment. I mean, they won. They beat the Yankees by seven uh. games in the AL East. And you consider the expenditure the Yankees make every year and how these guys have built up their team with a different formula. Uh, their starting pitching is good. They, it's one thing to divest yourself of all these high price or soon to be high price players and then go get prospects, but you better hit on those prospects. And they traded Chris Archer uh, to the Pirates and who they get back, Tyler Glasnow and Austin Meadows. Um, yeah. You know, and there are examples of that throughout their entire roster. So I like is that. Is that pitcher they traded to the Cardinals? going to be good, you know, in the Azarena trade. <laughs> he better be. He I, better I was, be, yeah. I was texting with somebody even earlier before the World Series. The guy, Rosarena's got nine home runs <laughs> in the postseason, set a record. 
and this he was like a throw in that the main guy they wanted was Jose Martinez, who's like a DH type, not really a yeah. good defender, pretty good hitter. And uh, they trade their top left handed prospect and one of the top prospects in baseball to get him. And somebody in the Cardinal organization texted me back, said, this guy better be Randy Johnson because, yeah. I mean, the Cardinal outfield is not good at all. And the Cardinals uh, knew that Azarain is going to be real good? Or did they know? No, there's no way. There's no way yeah. you would give. And let me tell you, you deal with scouts. I deal with scouts. Uh, I've been surrounded my, by scouts my whole life. This, to me, reeks of analytics because any scout, or my eyes, or your eyes, or my wife's eyes, or my daughter's eyes, whoever's eyes, would watch a Rosarena take batting practice, and then watch everybody else in his group at the big league level, and go, that guy has faster hands, and the ball explodes off that guy's bat. If you, you if they were all unnamed players, you go, that's the guy I want. And, and to give up on that guy, or trade him in a deal, and then say, oh, well, we knew it. Th- this has got to be, there's got to be some analytical reason that they said of all these outfielders that the Cardinals have, and they have they have like nine of the same kind of outfielder, that we're going to trade, this is the guy we're going to get rid of. They don't have anybody like that on their team. So I, it's a huge mistake. It's a big whiff. You, you, they, they lost an everyday player that, that's electrifying. And uh, I said on the air the other night, He's the guy now that when you know he's coming up in the half inning, you don't get up and go right. you know, go to the bathroom or go get something to drink. You wait until after he hits to see what he does. And and the, there are very few people that are like that. It trout's like that. There are very few people like that in baseball. The other thing I was going to ask you about is I'm fascinated by Walker Bueller. If, if, if I could have one pitcher in baseball right now, I might take him over to Grom. I don't know why. I just... I really have faith in him. He seems almost like a Hershiser type, you know, yep. a, metro, a metronome. He just goes and goes. And I know he's got this blister thing, but what's Bueller like? And is he going to be the next? Is he going to take the mantle from Kershaw, who took it from the long history, Fernando or Koufax yep. or Drysdale? Is he, is he that good, Joe? Yeah, I you know he's a little bodied guy. He jokes about it. Did with us. He's he's listed at one eighty five. He said I probably put on ten pounds. So he said I'm probably one ninety five. But it takes him a while to get going because everything he has, every ounce he has to his body mass is behind every pitch. And yeah. and he said I it took me a while at the start of the year. Then he had the blister. Then he's coming back. Then he's got the blister again. And now this is the best he's felt and the best he's looked all year, which is bad news for Tampa Bay, because if this goes seven, they have to face him again. But I, to answer your question, you would love him. Uh, Is he the next guy? Yes. He's the guy now. And I think Kershaw would even probably tell you that. Uh, But he went to Vanderbilt, which is a great baseball program. And they did things there. They, They had a game called skins where their coach would, put the pitching staff in high leverage, tough situations, and they would make the pitcher figure out a way to get out of it. And I can't think of a better learning tool for young pitchers than second and third, nobody out, you're leading by a run. How are you going to keep the lead or how are you going to keep it tied? And we saw that in the NLCS. He had bases loaded, game six, nobody out, his team's facing elimination, and he looked like the same guy that started the game and he went strike out strike out ground out and didn't give up a run and i i think he's he is everything you want in a tough guy that is not scared of anything he knows he's better than every hitter that steps to the plate and uh yeah i i've gotten to know him a little bit through zooms and and through meetings in the past uh i i think he's fantastic yeah he's just fun i i don't know you know baseball i do not decry the way baseball is being played now I, because, I mean, I forget, there's a bunch of people out there who write how horrible baseball is because there's so many strikeouts. And I get that, but I don't, I, honestly, what do I care for guys? Strikes out or grounds out to short? I, it's an out. I, right. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's ruining the game at all. I think it's fascinating. I think all these pitches that they throw, I think the fact that so many guys now is a matter of, 
if just, uh, you know, regular is a matter of regularity or throw in 95, 98. That's it used to be just be a role as Chapman and then whoever. But right. I don't I don't know. What do you what do you think of the game right now? Well, I, I love power. Uh, I don't know anybody who doesn't. I don't know anybody who doesn't like seeing 101 on a radar gun and and pitchers that make it look easy and a home run that hit, you know hits into the upper deck. I mean, people that that's all good for the game. Um, that's how these guys are trained now. They're trained as power pitchers, and you know the 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 bottom line is these guys are coming in and and like you said, I've never seen. It used to be, oh my God, that guy throws 95. Now, if you throw 95, you're average, and and it the game has just evolved. So, I, I'm not the guy either. I'm not the get off my lawn guy. I do miss some of the strategy. I do miss seeing guys with the ability to put the bat on the ball and hit it where they want to hit it. And and that's a lost art. Bunting's a lost art. We had a safety squeeze the other night in the World Series, which was like mind blowing that it actually worked and it was done to perfection. Uh, but the game is what it is. And uh, I, I, I enjoy every night sitting there. And if a guy strikes out, I'm with you. If he pops up, if he grounds out, what's the difference? But if he puts the ball in play, the entire infield is swung around to one side and there's a guy at second base and you can just put the bat on the ball and get him over to third and make the RBI chance easier for the next guy who pops out to out to the outfield, then I think there's a little bit of strategy that's involved there. So I, I think there's a balance between the two, but I will always defer to power. Give me power any day over finesse uh, really in any sport. That That's what I prefer to watch. You know, there have been so really really fun moments this month in in the playoffs you know the brasso uh home run off a roll just chapman you know brett phillips the other night uh you know the last guy on the bench there's just something about the weirdness of baseball that happens a little bit more than in than in football but there's also a lot of weirdness in football that happens in fun things. Like what's the one play in football this year right now that everybody would say, Hey, what's been the best play of the first seven weeks of the season? I bet the vast majority of people, if you wrote down 10 plays, they would say DK Metcalf catching Buddha Baker by running 114 yards and running 23 miles an hour or whatever it was. And that is just, that's not a touchdown pass. That's not, that didn't even result in any points. But it's right. just, it's just, I just been really, I, I think in the month of October, there's really been some tremendously fun sports events and go back to the end of the basketball playoffs, which were really, really fun. I can't quite figure out, Joe, why there, people are not watching the way that they used to not just necessarily because there's the occasional game everywhere that'll get a huge number. But I thought this Marist poll was amazing where 46% of Americans say they're watching less sports during the pandemic, watching less sports on TV. I thought it would be 46% would say, or, or they would say I'm watching 46% more sports or right. something like that. How do you view that? Yeah, I think there are a lot of factors. I, I think we all realized during the pandemic, even people that cover sports or broadcast sports, that uh, that life, while I'm, I'm obsessed and sometimes it takes over my life, like it certainly does in October, that there is a big life outside of the day-to-day -day of sports. Yeah. And once you realize you can live without something, it, it, maybe it's harder to get back into it to the level of the degree that you did before. Uh, you found that out. I, I also think that 2020, with everything that's going on uh, politically, with everything that's going on, uh, you know, in this election cycle, uh, the way society just seems to be so polarized and it's, you know, you're in this camp or you're in that camp. And and now it just becomes a daily fight on on news channels it's hard to turn your eyes away from the fight too. I don't, you, you could probably look at that same poll 
and look at the amount of news that's being consumed or political talk shows that are being consumed, and I'm sure those numbers are way, way up. So I, I, I would say this, that the jewel events will always have that special feel. And, and I, you know, maybe, maybe 2020 is an outlier, but I think as we go forward, you give somebody a compelling seven game world series or a great football matchup or a great NBA final or a great Stanley cup final, people are going to find their way to it. Um, and, and, and I, I will always bet on that until I see differently. And, and I, I look at this world series, you're right. There's nothing like baseball when it comes down to Brett Phillips, who nobody's ever heard of, (laughs) winning a game against Kenley Jansen on the craziest of lying in his teammates. And man, I mean, there's just nothing like it. And, and so there's always going to be room for that. And, and I'm honored to get a chance to sit there and try and scream and yell and put my voice to it. Um, I'll end with this. The, uh, I wonder when you wake up in the morning and, you know, because you've had to do this a lot now and you wake up in the morning and you either are going to do a football game or a baseball game that day. When you wake up in the morning, are you a little bit slightly more excited to do baseball or football? I, I contend this. If, if I wake up, you and I are talking on Tuesday. If, I, if you're asking me this tomorrow, when I wake up for a game seven, there's nothing like it. And uh, I, I think that trumps everything. It right. trumps the Super Bowl. Uh, it's bigger than uh, Stanley Cup final. If you have a rooting interest, and I'm a huge Blues fan, and I saw this two Stanley Cup finals ago, they, I mean, that's there's nothing like that because it's end to end action, and you go from offense to defense in a blink, and you think you're going to score, and then you're holding your breath, hoping that the other team doesn't score. But game seven, there's nothing like it. Uh, but waking up knowing that you're about to do Tampa Bay Green Bay, or waking yeah. up knowing you're about to do. That's big. And, you know, if, if there is appointment television anymore, it still is the NFL um, or it's a game seven. And uh, and to me, being able to navigate the highs and lows of a game seven and somebody standing on the, on the mound with a ball, somebody standing at the plate with a bat. And in other years, a process that started in mid-February and ends at the end of October and it comes down to one pitch which, you know, we've been lucky enough to have a few times at Fox since we started this in 96. There is nothing like that drama. And the beauty of it is for me, I don't have to say anything. I I can just set it up and watch with everybody else and cap it when it ends. And there's just uh, game seven is is the best thing in sports. Uh, I can't. There's something about, you know, sort of what you do in the games that you do that seemed to be so much fun, especially like, as I look at it, you know, I was kind of following what you were doing and seeing Brady and Rogers. I just thought to myself, as much of a pain in the rear end as this must be to do a mega game the previous night and then wake up the next morning knowing that you're going to do quite possibly the last game that Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady will ever play against each other. That is cool. And that's why, that's why kind of the life of Joe Buck is a pretty good life. It is. (laughs) And I, and and I, I think back to my dad's career, uh, I guess to put a button on it, because we've talked a lot about him, you know, he had a a two year crack at, at uh, the world series on CBS. It was, it was not a fun experience for him. It was not a fun experience for my family going through that. He was in his mid sixties and it was, it was just a different time for somebody who had really made his name in radio and uh, to, but, but to know what the stakes are when you do a game on national TV and you're doing live play by play and now to go, you know, whatever it's been 30 years since then forward in 2020 
Uh, it is a high wire act at times. And, you know, you, you got to make sure you get it right or you're going to live in infamy on the Internet for blowing some big call or blowing some big moment. And uh, that's also what makes it fun. You know, yeah. you realize that that uh, you got your heart in your throat for a reason, A, because the game's insanely fun and B, because you don't want to mess it up. And uh, and and that's that's what it's been for the last two and a half weeks. And, uh, you know, let's let's end with this. You can do a, a June baseball game and you can make a mistake. That's one thing you do a December, January football game and you make a big mistake. That's another. And uh, and it's that it's that high wire act that I that I love and I live on that high wire and I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's so interesting you say that because I, I had a long debriefing with Jason Witten after his one year on Monday Night Football. That is the thing that shocked him. Absolutely shocked him that he can make a mistake in a game and it will reverberate 10 times longer and louder than even if he dropped a touchdown pass in a big game. It, and that was so incredibly interesting to him and, you know, to hear him talk about that and to me, you know. It's funny, you know, we talk about it all the time because Troy and I will sit there before a, before a game and we'll watch the studio shows and we jump around with a clicker. And, and it's like, if I said that, what that guy just said right now in the middle of the football game, I would never live that down. But, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's, for some reason, it's, if it's inside from kickoff to the final seconds, if it's in that window and you say something that is controversial or has a real strong opinion or make a mistake or whatever it is, it, it's, it, it does ring louder and longer than, yeah. than anything that happens around that time. So it's, it's a weird time to do play-by-play -play, uh, and, and a lot, a hell of a lot different than when my dad was just kind of saying whatever crossed his mind. I mean, <laughs> some of that stuff, I, it makes me sweat thinking, thinking about some of the stuff that came out of his mouth in a, in a purely harmless, fun way. But you have to think of so many different factions uh, and, and sides of every argument before anything comes out of your mouth, it's, it's really hard to have any personality when you do the yeah. game because there's, there's really, it, it, the world doesn't really allow it. Joe Buck, voice of MLB on Fox Sports, obviously voice of the NFL. Really, really appreciate you taking time in your busy season. Of course, man. You're the best. I appreciate it, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.